Selco and Selco Foundation. Why these two entities? So I think just before we started, I think it's good to just sort of set the base of that. Um, you know, Selco India, I think as many of you know, was this social enterprise that was started in the early 90s. Um, you know, it used this enterprise-based model to deliver solutions on the ground um, to underserved households, to um, small livelihoods, small businesses, and we did this through this, you know, tapping with local financial institutions as well as this doorstep model of a branch network. And it's worked quite well for us. I mean, over the years, over 20 years, you know, we've diversified our products, we've diversified the kind of people that we work with, the sort of solutions that we give. Um, and that's Selco India, 20 years. But I think somewhere along the line, I think in, um, you know, recent years, we've also been sort of asking ourselves, you know, the, the challenges that Selco faced, um, you know, whether it was, you know, you, you find different sort of communities, the kind of needs that they have, the sort of products that they require. A street vendor may require a light with a greater spread. Um, you know, this you may find a, a community in a slum area which does not want, which has access, uh, which doesn't have access to a financial institution but needs financing. You know, and then you may go to a rural area where there is a bank but, um, you know, the, the community has never got access to a financial institution. So there are all these different, you know, challenges that we faced and we had to really develop these solutions from scratch. And you know, somewhere along the way, whether it was you know policies that we had to work around, whether it was working with stakeholders like financial institutions, convincing them to do this financing, whether it's finding the right kind of product that we need, whether it's finding partners in different parts of um, even India to partner with who understand or who you know share our same philosophy, it was sort of an uphill ride. And I think somewhere along the way we said, you know, if Senko is taking so long to find a solution, if we are taking time to sort of scale up, even find the right investors or financiers for ourselves, it must be the same for other organizations as well. Plug in the gaps in the ecosystem for this sector, whether that's policy, whether that's entrepreneur incubation, whether that's finding the right kind of financing, enterprise financing for entrepreneurs and other organizations like Selco. Um, you know, whether it's this grassroots level R&D, finding the right products, the right financial uh, innovations. I mean, who is actually going to do that? And I think Selco Foundation is sort of positioning itself and we see ourselves as being that sort of one-stop shop sort of solution for, um, you know, a database of solutions to kind of address all these different challenges that are there in the ecosystem. How do we build these problems or these challenges? How do we learn from them? Selco India, obviously what I tend to look at is if Selco, it's a challenge for Selco India, it's probably a challenge for the sector. If we are able to find a solution um, for Selco India, we should be able to find a solution for the sector. So I think for us, we see Selco Foundation as an organization that serves the sector, serves all the different stakeholders in the energy access space, um, you know, in, in India and the world. So that's. I would say we see ourselves as this ecosystem builder, as a complementary uh, sort of part of Selco India. But Selco India sort of works as a partner for us, just as any other um, enterprise would or any other stakeholder. So these are sort of, I mean, Selco Foundation and uh, Selco one size fits all approach. And I think in that, um, if you see, if you put that context in in the context of India, if you if you embed that in the idea of India, then I think. We all can recognize, I mean, I think what India is called like a mini Europe, right? Like the north is very different from the south, east, west. I mean, I think a lot of my colleagues will agree that even in Karnataka, north Karnataka is very different from the south, the west, the east. So, I mean, we're all, we're a very diverse country. And I think for us, we sort of see India as this, this lab of, you know, experiments. This is crucible of like all the different possible challenges that one can encounter. Uh, the different sort of solutions that you can possibly think of. So therefore, um, if you have, for example, um, a community, an urban slum community in Bangalore that is trying to um, you know, get access to a financing solution in the absence of a bank, and we're able to create, say, uh, you know, a financial innovation like a revolving fund um, with a community partner, and we're, supposed, we're able to provide them access to financing through such a, a, a model. Can that same model be applicable, say, in Northeast India, to a community that also doesn't have access to a bank. You know, can be the different customer segment, different geography, but the same sort of solution. They're able to reach more people um, and with local partners who can contextualize those solutions because they understand those regions well. 
it will probably, the scale or the, the, the way in which we reach people will probably be faster than if SEDCO were to go to every sort of state in India and try to start from scratch. So scaling impact versus supersizing the organization, I think that for us, um, you know, sort of underlines this whole um, idea of, of replication. Example, this is, um, you know, an integrated energy center. It's a concept that was started five years ago in SEDCO. It's a solar powered community center. Um, I think some of you may have, you know, already visits, I mean, heard of something like this. It's like an energy kiosk, so to speak. And the an integrated energy center will have a host of services, right? So you, it provides, um, you know, drinking water services, lighting services. It's built in within the community, and um, it provides a host of services that are needed by that community. It can be a common space with the community and self foundation. And um, we have done now, I think, about 20, 25 integrated energy centers, IECs, across Karnataka, a few in Orissa, and I think, um, you know, Rajasthan as well. So we have, you know, replicated that concept of an IEC, and I think we asked ourselves, if we were to break down how you think of how you build an IEC. I mean, you'll see these seven steps. You have to think of how you identify the community. How do you do needs assessment for that community? Um, what are the kind of partnerships that you need? What are the important partnerships that you need for an integrated energy center? Do you need a community partner? Do you need a financial partner? Um, the design of the center itself, um, you know, how actually you deliver those solutions to the community, monitoring and evaluation, and of course expansion of services that are there within the integrated energy center. So what, what we would say is that these are the nine steps that go into creating an integrated um, energy center. If you were to say go to a completely different country, Cambodia, and they want to set up like drinking water shops, and this was, I mean, it was an idea that came to us. Um, somebody had approached us saying, you know, if I were to look at the integrated center, how can I, you know, how can I look at something like that and uh, provide a solution to drinking water shops? You know, if we just look at the partners that we have worked with, there is immense amount of support that had to go in as far as uh, technical and operational support. That was something that we had to build very closely with these partners. It was not that, you know, you know, you, you say, oh, you know, this is a great idea. Service camp is a great idea. You know, here, take, here, read this document and, you know, do it. There was a team here at Selco Foundation which worked very closely with the partner. And I think, you know, we are also, it leads into the second point of HR on both sides. I think, you know, when you're starting with enterprises, they are, you know, struggling for their own resources, you know, technical resources, operational support. So who, how do you bridge that? And so there was this need that if you're going to work with a partner, they too have the resources to take on something like this. And you have a dedicated team in-house that is actually looking at, um, you know, supporting this replication effort. Um, you know, things like uh, constant communication, like, I, this seems very innocuous, I know that, uh, yes, communication, communication, but I think it was like our lines were open 24-7. I think, you know, you, you, I think the part of the, 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 the connection of all this is when you're working with people in very different regions or when you're working with other partners, how do you constantly keep that line or that channel open, which is very, very important. And I think for us that has also been, it's a very key part, it seems very silly to sort of mention it, but it is something that tends to get um, lost in this entire discussion. Um, you know, understanding local needs, market potential, so if you want to replicate a concept in a completely different region, or if you know, we want to take another concept, spending time understanding what that need is, was something where the local partner played a critical role. And without that, if you're going to just take a, take a idea and try to replicate it somewhere else, it's not going to work unless you understand what that ground reality is. And that's where a local partner becomes a very place <coughs> um, Capture and solution diversification. In Selco itself, it is now a mandate in the foundation to have to do replication. Every team, it is part of their deliverable. It's something we have internalized. And I think when you have that sort of mandate, it does trigger a way in okay, I've developed this solution, how else can it be taken up by somebody else? Or how do we think of taking a solution from somewhere else and applying it to our work? And I think that has also triggered our thought process a lot. We have internalized this deliverable. And the last, um, yeah, I think, you know, this sort of, um, you need some sort of flexible uh, financing. You need to be able to take that high-risk money and do a little bit of these fail-forward approaches. Will it work? Will it not work? We don't know. And I think we've been able to get that support um, in the last couple of years from our investors and more specifically from GIZ and USAID. And I think that was also very important 
to this entire process, to hone in on what this concept was, how do we look at it across different areas. This um, sort of financial support was very important in what we did. So, um, yeah, that's, that's it.